let me say a word in defense of reason in dialogue with faith. Because faith is that proof. Faith unites us to that substance. But reason, in order to realize its full potential, needs the horizons revealed by and truths contained in the faith. And not just any faith, but the Catholic faith. So let's give three, what I would call signs of design from uh, physics and astronomy, from the material sciences. Think of these as those physical necessary conditions for the existence of chemically based life. I don't think any of these are anywhere nearly sufficient conditions for the origin of life, but they're necessary. All right, and what's funny is, I don't know why this is, but it's slightly less controversial to talk about design in the physical sciences than in biology. I, I, I call it the Sco Scopes monkey trial problem, you know. <laughs> There's all the baggage when it comes to biology. Most of you may know these stories. I'll mention them just very briefly. But the first is, of course, this, this discovery that the universe has an age, that it's finite in the past. Uh, the general consensus of scientists in the 19th century was that the universe was eternal. In fact, that presupposing the existence of the universe was a fundamental assumption of all science. There were scientists in the 30s and 40s that said even the question of whether the universe had a beginning, where it came from, that, you can't even discuss that in science. And yet, of course, Edwin Hubble began uh, in an interesting set of discoveries when he was studying these so-called nebula. Uh, we now call them galaxies. He was able to measure the distances to these, and as he measured more and more of them, he noticed a pattern of a red shifting of these clusters of galaxies. Um, and the red shifting, that is the shifting of the light toward the red part of the spectrum, implied the universe was expanding in every direction. Uh, and it, this is actually even a sort of a relation called the, the, the relation between the redshift and the distance for extragalactic nebulae. And it's basically this. The farther away something a galaxy is, the faster or the redder its light is. That's a huge implication. It takes the mind about five seconds to work it out. As it turns out, Einstein's general theory of relativity had actually predicted in its original form that the universe should be expanding or contracting. Einstein didn't like it, added a variable to prevent the problem repented of it, in part uh, based on the evidence of Hubble and others. But think about it for five seconds. The universe is expanding. Everything in the matter, space, time, and energy is in a state of expansion in every, in, in every single place. R reverse the tape of cosmic time, and there's going to be a point in a finite past. Right? In fact, with a, a few more uh, a, a rigorous discoveries and analyses, uh, the, a widespread assumption came that there would be a point in the finite past in which the universe would coalesce into a point of infinite volume, or infinite density and zero volume. Now that doesn't prove the doctrine of creation, obviously, ex nihilo, but it's really a lot of trouble if you're a materialist. God could create an eternal universe. So, you know, that's, it's an interesting question. But it's very hard to be a materialist if the material universe began to exist. That's, that tells you that the material universe, if anything, is at least a crummy candidate for ultimate explanation. And it gives force to this, this, uh, this type of a, the cosmological argument uh, that before, I think, was almost purely speculative. It basically goes like this. Anything that begins to exist must have a cause for its existence. The universe began to exist. Therefore, the universe must have a cause for its existence. And you can work that out. It's got to be something other than the universe. It's got to have the capacities to build our uni universe into existence. If you deny that, you end up saying very weird things like Stephen Hawking said last year. He said, because a Lucasian professor of mathematics at, at Cambridge, which was Newton's chair, said in the press and repeated, uh, because of a law such as gravity, the universe can and will create itself spontaneously from nothing. That's what you're left with, right? If you're going to be a materialist, you're left with something like that. To which I, that seems to me to be a reductio ad absurdum of, of the materialist case. But that's, that's a huge thing. And this was the discovery uh, of scientists that weren't looking for it, and in fact generally didn't like the idea. Here's how Robert Dickey at Princeton, who was important in the, uh, the sort of analysis of the cosmic background radiation, he said, an infinitely old universe would relieve us of the necessity of understanding the origin of matter at any finite time in the past. Relieving is not a technical scientific term, <laughs> all right? The verb betrays him here. Now, again, the universe, if it were eternal, could still, of course, be contingent and so created by God. But if it has a beginning, it's really troubling to the materialist. It doesn't provide the kind of relief that would be preferred. 
Now, you might say, okay, that's a cosmological argument. Not a, it doesn't really have to do with the teleological or design argument. But the interesting thing is that because the universe had a beginning, we can now talk about things like initial conditions and, and physical constants. Here's Martin Rees. He said, the possibility of life as we know it depends on the values of a few basic physical constants and is, in some respects, remarkably sensitive to their numerical values. Nature does exhibit remarkable coincidences. Now here he's talking about constants. These are just these, these things that are true kind of everywhere in the universe. So popular ones, we think about forces, you know, sort of as laymen, uh, uh, the fundamental forces of, of gravity and electromagnetism and the strong and weak nuclear force, which have particular values and particular size scales and things like that. And Reese is saying those have to be very precisely tuned, remarkable coincidences. There's also this question of initial conditions. What was the universe like? What did it need to be like at the beginning in order to be anything like what it is now? This is Paul Davies. Again, these, are, these guys, neither of these guys are theists. So the present arrangement of matter indicates a very special choice of initial conditions. And in fact, the choice is, is mind-boggling if you're sort of interested in big numbers. And the basic idea is that the universe looks like it's very precisely fine-tuned for the existence of complex life. There's all sorts of ways that a universe could be, and the more physicists have come to understand these things, the more they've been able to realize this and to say, okay, what would the universe be like? You imagine it as a universe creating machine, and it's got all the dials on it that specify the various constants and the values of these things in the universe, and then what happens if you change one of those? The idea of fine tuning is that if you fiddle with one of the dials, even if you leave one of the others, all the others the same, you end up with an uninhabitable universe, uninhabitable by any kind of plausible chemically based life. That's fi the cosmic fine tuning, the stuff that's true everywhere. But what's interesting is that it, even in a universe that's habitable, that's finely tuned at the cosmic level, you still got to get a whole lot of stuff right at the local level in order to have a so-called habitable planet. That is a, a planet, a location where life can persist and exist. Now I'm going to give you a really quick thumbnail sketch because this is the argument that Guillermo Gonzalez and I make in The Privileged Planet. And I'll tell you when we get to the controversial stuff, all right? This is not the controversial stuff, is that in this universe with this periodic table of the elements, there's nothing like carbon for building large information-rich, you know, micromolecules, macromolecules, all the kind of things that chemically-based life needs. In fact, there's no other atom that comes close to uh, carbon in its ability to form large called metastable or metastable molecules and to bond with so many other elements. In other words, it, it's stable enough that you can build complex structures, you can use it to code for information, but it's not so stable that it can't also sort of interact chemically. And as it happens, water is liquid over the same narrow range of temperatures over which carbon chemistry is most reactive. So carbon and water are these un really uniquely fit things for building uh, any form of chemically based life. Our arguments completely based on that, if we find a fundamentally different type of life around an X-ray belching star in a totally different system, we're going to have problems with our argument. But I just tell you that it's an assumption, but it's also widely held uh, and not all that widely disputed for very good reasons based on chemistry. Well, what that means automatically is that just based on the rules of chemistry, there are going to be very few locations in the universe where you're going to have life. Uh, of any sort. And it turns out the more we've learned, the more we realize that in fact you need a very long and growing list of ingredients of things to build a habitable planet. Here's just a few of the things. You need the right kind of terrestrial planet, a rocky planet that's the right size, so it has the right kind of gravity, the right kind of geological activity uh, in, in its core. You need a large stabilizing moon, like our moon, it stabilizes the Earth uh, on its tilt of its axis. You need plate tectonics, Interestingly, that's not a happy story because I live in Seattle, and so we sort of deal with the bad side of that, but it turns out you need it, ultimately. You need the right kind of atmosphere, at least for large uh, life like ourselves, probably nitrogen, oxygen rich. You need the right kind of planetary neighbors. It turns out that you know, the other planets almost certainly don't have life on them, but these large planets like Jupiter and Saturn are very important for protecting the inner part of the solar system from the visitation from these comets in the outer part of the solar system. You can think of them, they sort of take a lot of hits for us. Comets, is, they're like your crazy ant. You don't want her visiting your neighborhood very often. You know, you show up, exterminate life and things like that. So you know, it's weird because you know, the astrologers thought these planets played a role in our existence. It turns out they do in a different way. You need the right kind of single star. Almost certainly, most stars in our galaxy are not these single stars like the sun. You need the right kind of star, probably one very much like our own. 
You need to be in the right kind of galaxy, probably a large, heavy element rich galaxy like the uh, Milky Way. You need to be in the right location, there's a certain neighborhood in the galaxy. Uh, you need to be at the right cosmic time, and you need to be, as I said, in that a universe fine tuned for life. And you need to be, there's a lot of other stuff, you need to be in the right place around your star, in the so called Goldilocks zone. Right? So it's not too hot and not too cold for maintaining liquid water. So you get a lot of this stuff, and when people hear this, they initially and intuitively say, wow, this is like Paley's watch. You know, all these things had to come together to make life possible. Isn't that another good piece of evidence for design? And I, I think yes, but the problem is the skeptic can say, okay, maybe the fine-tuning the cosmic level is, makes sense, but the universe is a huge place. You know, there's probably maybe 10 to the 22 stars in the observable universe. Huge opportunities. So it could be the universe is just this grand cosmic lottery. And yeah, it's highly improbable you're going to get all these things together. But given a big, big enough universe, maybe it happens, you know, just purely kind of by, by what we would call uh, random processes. Now, even if that's true, of course, it's possible that God uh, intended it. So it's, not, it's only apparently random and not really random or purposeless, as I would put it. The question is, still, is there any positive evidence for design here? That is, is there something in addition to this that suggests coincidence rather than conspiracy? And we think there is. I think if you look at the, the details of the evidence uh, here, what you discover is that those conditions for habitability correlate with the conditions for measurability or discovery. Now, Guillermo, my co-author of The Privileged Plant, sitting here in the front row, I'm going to tell you that was his idea for the title of the book. Right there. <laughs> and I said, that, yeah, that's going to sell a lot. <laughs> so we, we ended up coming up, I think, with a better title. But here's the, here's the basic idea. The same narrow range of circumstances that allow us to exist also provide us with the best overall setting for making a wide range of otherwise sort of competing scientific discoveries. Or to put it differently, the very conditions that make Earth hospitable to intelligent life also make it well suited to viewing and analyzing the universe as a whole. Just to cut to the chase, what we're saying is that the possibility of science is built into things, every bit as much as the fine-tuning for life itself. So what we do in the book, it's very much a comparative argument. It's not at all a deductive argument. It's like the argument a, a, you know, a lawyer in a, a case in court would make, in which we come up with, we give a lot of examples of the things you need for a habitable planet, and then we say, okay, let's compare that to less habitable planets and see, do those things that make the Earth habitable to life also make it better suited to doing science on that planet than compared to, uh, to less habitable planets. And so we give a lot of examples in the book uh, that, and I'll just give two very quickly. I don't, this, as I said, it's a cumulative case argument, which means you can't make it persuasively in eight minutes. And so I'm gonna just give you very briefly so you kind of get the idea. First is this example of, of total solar eclipses, which is actually where this, this argument started. Now, most of you get what an eclipse is, right? You, you, at least a, a solar eclipse is when you get the moon, you get the sun, you get the earth all lined up in space, and then the moon is the occulting or eclipsing object, and it passes in front of the sun, between the earth and the sun, and so if you're on the path of the eclipse, you'll see this. You'll see the moon cover uh, the sun. And what's interesting, though, is that this could happen in a lot of different ways, but as it happens on the earth, so the apparent size of the moon just barely covers the sun as seen from Earth. So that gives us not just mere eclipses of some various sort, but some, you might call perfect eclipses. There's this virtually perfect match between the shape and the size of these two radically different and radically differently sized objects in the sky. Now Guillermo did a study of this. He thought, huh, I wonder what kind of eclipses you get elsewhere in the solar system. So he did a, what I assume was a tedious study that's much more fun to report than to have done. Um, to say, what, what would the eclipses be like on the other less habitable planets? I won't spend a lot of time with this, and I don't even know if you can see it in the light, but this basically is a, is a result of, of Guillermo's analysis of the major moons. The take-home lesson is that it's only on Earth that you get these, these perfect eclipses in our solar system. There's one other place, a little potato-shaped moon, uh, Prometheus around Saturn, that whips around Saturn, and so in just the right moment for a couple of seconds, you get what's close to it, but like I said, it's shaped like a potato. It's not, it's not round or spherical. So the, essentially, the one place where there are solar eclipses in the solar system is precisely where observers are there to see them. Now that's weird. In fact, I, even, I got a, a, an atheist, the 
Colorado's leading atheist, it was the, the tagline. I had this debate after the book came out. And I thought, that sounds like you know, the best downhill skier from Fort Lauderdale or something. I mean, is that good? You know? But he admitted that, OK, if it's true that there's this correlation between life and discovery, it would be weird. It would be you know, suggestive. Uh, and then he you know, went on to talking about how I went to church and stuff like that. But um, so there's something weird and fishy about it. But the question is, is there more to it than that? Well, what's interesting is that perfect eclipses are very important for scientific discovery. Now remember, to get perfect eclipses, what do you need? You need a couple of things. You need your planet to be a certain distance from its host star. And if your planet's habitable, it's gonna, that's going to fix the distance from that star and so fix the size and appearance of that star in your sky. You also need a large, well-placed moon, right? On a habitable planet, that's going to fix the size and location of that moon in your sky. As it turns out, those two conditions needed for habitability provide perfect eclipses for those on its surface. All right, so two crucial conditions for habitability produce perfect eclipses, which themselves are very, very important in scientific discovery. I'll give you just a, a brief example. is this famous test of general relativity, which Einstein predicted essentially um, that, that uh, large, massive bodies, uh, gravity uh, wells or fields of these bodies would affect light specifically. So, you know, a specific prediction he had is that if you could sort of analyze and determine where a set of stars were in the sky at one point, come back and then measure the location, of the apparent location of those stars when the sun is in the sky near them, right, the, the, the stars would appear to move from their locations. They didn't actually move, but what happened is that light was affected by the mass of the sun, and it needs to pass right near the edge of the sun. Now, what's the problem with that experiment in most circumstances? It don't, this is this kind of tell your kids, don't try this at home, right? You don't try to look for stars right near the edge of the sun under normal circumstances. But one time you'd want to do that is when you get perfect eclipses, and they need to be nearly perfect. Um, you know, if they're just slightly smaller eclipses, in fact, the sky is too bright, if they're much, the moon were much larger, it would probably block the very stars that are affected by this effect. And this effect was first detected in 1919, kind of imprecisely, and then confirmed uh, in subsequent eclipses. So it's a very important discovery. It's, and it's just one thing, one example of what eclipses have given us. Let me give you one more example of this. I mentioned briefly a couple of minutes ago that there's a, a neighborhood, a location within particular galaxies in which uh, a planet probably needs to be if it's going to be habitable for very long. And in fact, you're not, first you need to be in the right kind of galaxy that has the right kind of elements, things heavier than, than helium. Astronomers call all the elements heavier than hydrogen and helium metals, which I assume you do that so you don't have to remember all the others. You know? So you've got these light elements, hydrogen, helium, and the metals. And you need metals to build planets and cells and bodies and things like that. So you need a large galaxy for various reasons to do that. And there's this sort of gradient in spiral galaxies like our own in which you get more heavy elements clo the closer you get to the center of the galaxy. So you need to be close enough to it to have those heavy elements available, but not so close uh, that you end up you know, sort of dealing with very dangerous things. So the habitable planet needs heavy elements, but to survive complex life, you, don't want, to be, you want to be close but not too close. Uh, there's probably a, a giant black hole. There's certainly very dense sort of stars and supernovae going off in the center of the galaxy. You don't want to be really close in the neighborhood. In fact, you probably even want to be between the spiral arms of the galaxy. Basically, the galactic habitable zone is about midway out from the center to the edge of the galaxy between spiral arms and rotating around the galaxy in more or less the same pace as the other stuff. And so here's, here's where we are, uh, registered by a satellite that we sent up out of the galaxy a couple of years ago. Um, not really, if you know the size scales on these things. Uh, it took us a long time actually to figure this out. But we're about midway out from the center to the edge of the galaxy between the Sagittarius and Perseus arms. You won't be surprised if I told you, okay, this is what you need, then for us to discover that, oh, hey, we're in the galactic capital zone, right? That's not especially surprising because we wouldn't be here if we weren't there, right? But what's interesting is that that has implications. It means that there's going to be a lot of places if you're looking for life elsewhere, you don't waste your time looking. Look in this zone. Here's the technical diagram of the, the idea. <laughs> All right, so you got the blow up of our solar system with the little circumstellar habitable zone, and you got the center, which is very dangerous. All right, I'm coming right to the end here. So then the question is this that's great. 
But if you could be in only one place for scientific discovery, for figuring out there's a background radiation, distinguishing it from the galactic radiation, seeing other kinds of stars, figuring out the structure of our galaxy, all these kinds of things that would, uh, the physical location, there would be competition for discovering these things. You could only pick one place to be. Where would you want to be? It's in the galactic habitable zone. All right, now that's, this question is so what? Well, Guillermo and I argue that this actually, con it conforms to a pattern that suggests something like conspiracy rather than mere coincidence. And this is how I would, this is a very pedantic way of putting it, but you can sort of say that it's, at the very least, it's confirmation of a design hypothesis like this, is this correlation between life and discovery is more likely on the hypothesis that the universe is designed for discovery than on the chance hypothesis. That is the hypothesis that there was, there's no sort of purpose to th these things in the universe. You just wouldn't expect this. If you thought there's no purpose to the universe, you see this, and what are you going to say? It's just weird. In fact, Discover Magazine in 1999 gave Guillermo's paper on eclipses a weird science discovery of 1999, because it doesn't make sense. But if you think the universe is perhaps designed, it has a purpose, and one of those purposes is to be read, is to be uh, understood, you might actually think something like that's true, and you wouldn't be surprised. It would confirm what you believed. So we'd argue the modest conclusion is that the universe is fine-tuned so that environments habitable to observers will provide the best overall conditions for observation and discovery, or that the universe looks like it's designed for discovery. Psalm 19 starts, the heavens declare the glory of God, the skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day they pour forth speech, night after night they display knowledge. What's interesting is that those heavens have displayed more knowledge at different times in history, and we live at a time in which we're privileged to discover that the universe is not only points beyond itself to God, to a purpose, because we believe that as a matter of faith, but that in fact, if we look at the evidence with open eyes, the natural world confirms that truth of the faith. Thank you very much. Thank you.